Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I am your host Joanna, let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome back. I'm your host Joanna and today I'm joined by Max Reisner who is a behavioural decision making expert working in behavioural and experimental economics and was also a behavioural scientist for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So today we're going to be talking about refining our decision making skills and removing barriers to help benefit our personal productivity. So let's get started. Hi Max, welcome to the show. Hi Joanna, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So before we get started, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself and a bit about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Um, So probably the kind of job title that I use for the work I'm doing and most people probably uh, use for for the work I do is I'm an applied behavior economist, which means understanding the psychology of how people act, how they decide what they decide, how they change when they decide to change, how they buy and what they buy. And it's really about sort of understanding how people actually make decisions rather than how they should make decisions. Um, and that's because we're all a little more rational than we'd like uh, to acknowledge, right? If, if we'd all be kind of rational, the, this world would probably be a bit boring, actually. There would be way less problems, that's for sure. There wouldn't be, um, you know, we'd all have a million dollars saved up for retirement. Um, mm-hmm. There would probably not be global warming. There wouldn't be obesity. But yeah, it's really about uh, my work is really about understanding how people actually make make decisions. So that's probably the behavioral economist part of what I'm doing. The applied part means I actually help organizations uh, apply those behavioral insights and tools to better understand that irrational brain, whether that's their own or that of the employees or customers. Yeah, great. Amazing. Um, And I know that you've worked in a lot of different countries before you came to Sydney. Can you tell me a bit about your, like how you did that and how you found yourself here now? Yeah, sure. So um, for those of you who could tell yet from listening to my terrible accent, I'm actually German. (laughs) Um, I'll never get rid of that accent, I think, uh, even if I would be in Australia for 20 years. But yeah, so that's where I originally from. That's where I, you know, sort of kind of my work journey and probably getting into the field of behavioral economics started for my studies. And yeah, as part of that, I, um, yeah, kind of worked and lived in a few different countries in Europe. And then I came to Australia in, yeah, four years ago now. Um, And I was actually just meant to be here for sort of a couple of months and then just, yeah, never left. Um, So, you know, this is the kind of fell in love with the country, the nature, and then also thought there's great opportunities in the field of behavioral economics. So yeah, that's how I sort of ended up ended up here, down under. Amazing. It's great to hear that you're loving it, being in Australia. Um, so now we're just going to get into some guest questions. So this is where I'm just going to ask you um, some more personal questions that aren't necessarily related to what we're talking about today. Um, so let's talk about books. Are you a book person at all? Um, I mean, let me have a look on my bookshelves. Actually, just I mean, like if you could see my bookshelves, it's basically ninety nine percent behavioral science related books, um, which are kind of related, obviously, to what I do. Um, so yeah, I think I'm a book person, kind of in the in the field what I'm, um, what I'm doing. But I mean, there is one book actually that sticks out, um, and it's called Mi Amano Pablo. Uh, and that's that's probably the only one in my bookshelf that's not behavioral science related. And that's just because I want to uh, improve my Spanish a little bit. And my partner, who's Colombian, she said, oh, read this. This is uh, easy to understand, kind of sort of an easy Spanish. It's actually 
uh, from from the brother of Pablo Escobar and sort of from pornography. Oh. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just super interesting and how, how they talk about how they basically came from nothing. So the man literally had to steal shoes for them. They had to walk like 40 kilometers to school every morning. And then, you know, we all kind of know, know what happened then. Um, Pablo Escobar ended up being one of the richest person in the world. Now, not that I obviously support any of the way he got there, but it's just, yeah, interesting. And the cool fact about this book is actually apparently uh, my, my partner told me you can't buy it anymore. It's not being published anymore. Oh. And you can only get it in Colombia. So wow, yeah, they... maybe, um, you know, maybe I'm sort of a book person having that unique piece, but yeah, I would, yeah. Um, I would be any fact, yeah. That's really cool. Um, so do you speak other languages as well? I do. So um, in Germany, we're actually kind of lucky enough to actually learn quite a lot of languages. So I, well, I spent five years of my life learning Latin. Not that there would be any language you can speak, and I don't know how to <laughs> yeah. help me. But um, so that's how it all started. Then uh, they they teach you French, which I really love. Oh. Um, I actually always preferred French over English. Um, and yeah, then obviously English, um, which which I'm still improving as well. And <laughs> now that I'm, I've been for three years with my partner who's Colombian. I was kind of a bit forced to learn Spanish, and I really enjoy it. And anyone that wants to learn. Uh, Spanish, um, study with a Colombian native speaker because I feel like their Spanish is very clean and doesn't have a strong accent. And then you go to other parts and I don't understand anything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a, sort of a few languages that I try to speak um, and improve. Yeah, wow. I've always been terrible at learning languages and hearing that you can speak so many. That's really impressive. Um, and are there any like TV shows or movies that you're into? Um, or any recommendations you have maybe? Plenty. Um, yeah. I mean, quite recently, actually, I, you know, there's always sort those of classics everyone knows, but so maybe a bit more sort of unique recommendation. I actually think that I really like Spanish speaking um, movies. Not that I understand them, so I have to put on the like, English subtitles. But I bought one, um, actually, I think they're made in Argentina. So they must be really good at making movies because I love those movies. And one was called uh, Eres Tu, so that means uh, it's you. And it was about that guy who had that gift that he could basically tell at the first kiss if a woman was the woman of his life or wow. what sort of the story was. Obviously, it's you know, um, fictional, but... Yeah, it was just great and like funny and just hilarious movie. And he found like the love of his life. And sometimes it was funny. You could like kiss a woman and then he'd like see in a few seconds, sort of the next few years and ended up with you know, a catastrophe. So he could actually end it straight there. And it was just funny. And there's another one, um, which was called Mucho Amor Para da. Both on Netflix, by the way. So yeah, there's two, Ooh. Mucho Amor Para da. Um, yeah. And the second one means a lot of love to give, also made in Argentina. And it was about that guy who had two families at the same time. So two bikes, one basically Mondays to Thursdays, and then he would travel three <laughs> hours to Buenos Aires. And over the weekend, he has a second family. And just like hilarious. And in the end, the women actually meet each other and find it out. And it's just great. So I think actually, um, yeah, you should watch more Spanish-speaking movies. And, you know, they all have subtitles and I think they make great movies. Yeah, I definitely will need to get into that. Um, those sound really interesting, especially the second They're one. Funny, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds pretty funny as well. Um, and lastly, I really want to ask you about any famous role models that you have. I find that always a really interesting question to ask. It is, yes. And I feel like it's one of those questions. I mean, you have to have an answer to this. And yeah. I currently <laughs> don't. Um, I think I don't have that one sort of famous or popular role. I, th I think many people have like, you know, someone well-known or maybe um, their parents. And I, I think that's great. I think for me, it's more those little sort of everyday role models. So as part of like, usually like three months a year, I actually travel in, in our van with my partner and we kind of travel around Australia and try to see more of this amazing country. 
Um, and through those travels, we have met such interesting people. So for example, this couple, shout out to Shelly and Ben, if, if you guys listen to this podcast, but Shelly is a cardiac physiologist and Ben a videographer, and they've spent the last three years or so traveling in their van around Australia while working sort of full time. Um, and I just thought, oh, th like, that's amazing. I want to be a little bit more like them. So it's sort of like a, yeah, a bit of a role model. Or then there's this lovely lady down the beach, uh, which I see every day. And she's just there, um, you know, writing in her journal every day, um, drawing people. I think she told me she has like drawn me like 10 times by now. And, I didn't <laughs> and she is just so authentic and you can feel how happy she is just doing that simple sort of, you know, that sim those simple things make her so happy and she seems fulfilled. She doesn't need more. So I would also say maybe she's a little bit of a role model because I think I want to be a bit more like her. So I think I don't have that one role model, but maybe a few people that I think, oh, I'd love to maybe learn something from them, be a bit more like them. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I feel like it is a hard question because you feel pressure to have like someone famous that you look up to, but having those little role models in your life is really great. I feel like I'm very similar in that way too. Like I look to my family and stuff like that. So that's really great. Um, so now I think we'll get into the more nitty gritty stuff. As I mentioned today, we're talking about decision making and aiding personal productivity. So for our listeners, how would you define personal productivity? Yes. Two, probably two versions I got there. One is probably a simple one, one a bit the longer, longer uh, definition. But I think what it really comes down to for me is personal productivity is, is that feeling after a long day um, of having achieved something, right? Of having achieved your goals or maybe completed your to-do list and just getting stuff done in the time frame that you have planned for it. And also being able to focus on those things. So yeah, I think that's a simple version. Just that feeling of having achieved something at the end of the day. I think that's to me, oh, I've been productive today. And then probably sort of the bit uh, longer version of that is that I think productivity is a combination of prioritization and decision making. And what I mean by this is, in order to be productive, I need to be able to prioritize which tasks I want to get done today, which ones are sort of the most important ones on the top of my to-do list, how I'm going to spend my energy, my time, resources in order to get those done. So it's like, yeah, being able to prioritize, being able to manage your time and also setting reasonable goals, right? Um, if you, you know, if you're, set unreasonable goals and that can be short or long term say you have a to-do list which is just so long and there's no way you can complete it within the day well maybe you have the feeling at the end of the day you haven't been productive but it's not because you haven't been productive it's maybe just because your goals have been unreasonable so yeah being able to prioritize and long term as well you know having the goal of becoming a billionaire by the end of the year well again maybe a bit unreasonable maybe you feel you haven't been you know, productive enough to achieving that goal, but actually it's just that goal that is, is, is too far in the future or too difficult. So that's the first part. And decision-making uh, means that I think you can make conscious decisions towards getting you into that productive environment and into that state of flow. Um, reducing that likelihood of getting distracted. And so what happens to me, for example, is, you know, I, I have great plans, being productive today. I have eight hours free. I have all those goals. And then I end up scrolling through social media, lying on my bed, and watching Netflix uh, and procrastinating. Now, there is conscious decisions you can make to avoid that risk of being unproductive, right? You could say, okay, I'll... Um, I'll actually block, you know, block my social media apps for the day. Um, or I maybe don't even take my phone into, you know, the, the room I'm working in. Uh, maybe I get rid of my TV because I know I'm that person. I just switch from the TV and then get distracted. So I think there is yeah, conscious decisions you can make 
to get you into a more productive environment and design that environment, but you also need to prioritize what you want to get done um, and how to sort of manage your resources and time. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a longer definition, but yeah, the simple one is just getting stuff done, having the feeling of having achieved your goals. Um, yeah, no, that's great. I feel like there are so many different definitions for personal productivity. Um, everyone defines productivity in a different way because everyone's productive in different ways. So would you say it's pretty subjective, for example, like what you would, the techniques or like strategies you would use to be more um, like productive, that's very subjective to the individual? Oh, 100%. There is no one size fits all solution for you know being productive i you know as i said like in my case i might know sort of what are my sources of um temptation or instant gratifications you know for me it might be that phone that oh i just check one message and then suddenly 20 minutes later you're still on the phone and you've been unproductive some other people might not be tempted at all by that maybe for them it's you know, just that that walk every 30 minutes to the fridge or um, or that sort of stuff. So I think it really comes down to what are your maybe bad habits when it comes to being productive and what gets you into that state of flow. Um, you know, another, like, do you know those moments when, for example, you're like under the shower and suddenly the ideas just flow through your head and it just pops up and you're like whoa like i haven't even been thinking about anything oh you know for me it's when i'm in the ocean swimming suddenly you know those ideas come it's not really be productive but in a sense it is because you're not forcing it and i think even you know those moments don't happen by coincidence by the way those are moments where our mind can just flow can just sort of focus while not focusing on anything it's that divergent thinking um, that that you allow. And again, this is also one of those moments that's different for everyone. Some people can just come up with ideas, you know, being sort of productive and brainstorming and any sort of stuff. Some people, it just happens under the shower. Some people, when they're swimming, it's really, really different. And that's what makes it exciting, right? And that's why behavioral economics is called behavioral economics. It's just like, you know, that almost economy of different people that have different ways of thinking. Um, yeah. And, yeah, the feeling again. Yeah, no, definitely. That's actually such a good point because everyone has all these different ways. And I feel like some people think, oh, I'm not that type of person to be productive or I'm just not good at being productive. Um, but everyone can be productive, right? There's always a way, even if you're not good at it, there's always a way to overcome it. Yeah, I, I love what you just said because that's what I think many people get wrong about um, productivity we often maybe look up to successful people and think, oh, they just got it. Like, like they're just able to focus, they're productive, they're hustling. You know, it's just sort of a predisposition. It's, it's genes and talent. And I think many people think being productive is also determined by your talent of being productive or by your genes. But what I actually think is the case that while it's, maybe to some degree we all have predispositions some people are better in some things than they are in other things i think there's a lot of tiny little hacks or habits that can help you anyone become more productive and that's what i think successful people don't have the talent of being productive or those genes i think they're just very good in having habits tiny habits that bring them to that goal of of, of being productive. And if you think about it, like most of our outcomes in life are sort of um, determined by our habits, right? We say we want to become richer, we want to become fitter. Well, your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your fitness is a lagging measure of your you know, workout routine habit. Your uh, productivity is actually a lagging measure of a whole bunch of daily habits. It's your self-control habits. It's your um, yeah privatization habits, as I said. It's your organizational habits. How well are you in organizing stuff? It's your 
decision-making habits. It's all those tiny things that make you a more productive person, I think. Um, and that's, yeah, to your point, just many people saying either you have it or not. And I think that's not true, um, true at all. And by the way, this may be the perfect timing for a little disclaimer. Even though, you know, we talk about personal productivity today, that doesn't mean I am a super productive person myself. Like I struggle of all of those things we already talked about, we're probably going to talk about today. I struggle um, of those things myself. And it's, I think, just understanding a bit better how can you build tiny habits to overcome those self-control issues and, and put you in design that environment that works for you to become a more productive person. Yeah, amazing. And I think it's just really important to have that awareness that, oh, I might not be super great at being productive, but I know what I have to do in order to be more productive, which is really great. So um, hopefully by the end of this, people will have some more tips and of how to like develop those habits, which would be really amazing. And just moving on to our next question now, um, how can proper decision making impact an individual and how does it sort of propel one's personal productivity forward? Yes. So maybe let me start with kind of what I think uh, decision-making actually is. So I think to me, decision-making is the peop- uh, the way people um, behave every day, the choices they make, the way people behave towards each other, the way you behave to your employer, to your colleagues, to people you meet on the street. But also importantly, decision-making is the way you behave towards your future self. The decisions you make today, the choices you make today, well, if those are decisions around you, who do they affect? They affect your future self, right? Today, Joanna makes a decision to, um, you know, start a consistent, um, whatever, learning routine or course routine or workout routine. Well, who does that affect? Future Joanna. And I think proper behavioral, also proper decision making and maybe those tiny habits that help you become a more productive um, self, they really help you to become a better future self. So you make those tiny habits for you, for your future self. And um, that's how I think sort of proper decision-making, which probably starts with being aware of the biases of the heuristics. Sorry, so heuristics are sort of um, mental shortcuts that just, you know, you you jump to conclusions without really thinking it through. Sometimes that just sort of biologically helps our brain to process the information it it does and and be a faster decision-maker. And that can result in biases. But yeah, being aware of those biases, being aware of, hey, I often am over-optimistic. I say tomorrow I have eight days to work on that project and then, you know, that's going to be great. And then tomorrow arrives and you're going to, I don't know, the kids come home from school early. So suddenly it's only six hours left. Uh, You get like an emergency call from work, another hour left. Like, you know, just being aware of those things that can happen, of those biases, of those spending fallacies. I think that's what good decision-making and proper decision-making is. And it can help you to, yeah, to set more realistic goals and just become more productive. Yeah. And you mentioned that we all have different types of decisions we make. Um, Do you think there's like a difference between personal and professional decision-making? Yeah. I, I mean, think about how many decisions have you made today, right? It's both on a professional and private sort of, in a, pri- in, a, in a private uh, life, it's probably hundreds, if not even thousands from, you know, maybe your private ones are you wake up, okay, what do I have for breakfast? First decision to make, what do I wear? wear. Um, how, how do I get to, to work? Um, you know, do I delegate the decision to Uber and they bring me there? Do I ask Google Maps and let them make the decisions uh, decision for me? There's just thousands of decisions and, of course, they're different in nature. You know, they, I wouldn't really differentiate between professional and private. I would more say, you know, there's th- sort of smaller subconscious decisions that are made every day. And then, and, and then there are uh, conscious decisions that are made. And I don't know, have you heard of um, 
Have you heard? It's actually one brain analogy that really kind of helped me better understand human decision making is of the elephant and the rider by Jonathan Haidt. Have you have you heard of that at all? No, I haven't. What is it? So what it is is, and and that's by the way really kind of I think what when I heard about that the first time it really got me hooked with behavioral economics and I was like, yes, that is actually. You know, I know that elephant inside me, like that is how I make decisions. But let me explain what it is. So um, then the Kahneman and Amos Tversky in their book, Thinking Fast and Slow, described human decision making basically as being two systems that are at play all the time. It's like your two modes of thinking and that's system one and system two. And and maybe you have heard of those or I'm sure some listeners have. Um, it's sort of a very popular way to think about the mind for now. Also, disclaimer here, the human mind is much more complex than those two systems, but I think it's still a great way to simplify it and helps helps us think about it. So system one is our subconscious, irrational, sort of automatic, fast way of thinking. If you jump on your bicycle, you don't really have to make a lot of the conscious decisions, right? Or you don't have to think a lot. You just go for it. It's subconscious. And by the way, also that brain system that's responsible for all those gut feelings we have um, that that jump to our minds. And then there's system two, which is our sort of rational mind. It's slow, it's deliberate, it's effortful, it takes time. So that's those conscious decisions. If I would ask you to solve a complex math problem well you probably need to sit down maybe you need a pen and um, paper and it's sort of slow and you could probably even uh, observe you know your blood sugar dropping and it's just effortful so that's an example of system two thinking now Jonathan Haidt describes those two modes of thinking as the elephant and its rider the elephant being system one the irrational mind, the the subconscious mind, and the rider, the tiny rider on top of it, system two, the sort of rational mind, the conscious mind. Now, I was thinking you can kind of bring that to decisions and how it really made me wake up is, well, that elephant might have an idea of what he thinks about certain things. Like, you know, if the elephant wants to do one thing, and sort of bias the decision in one way, well, he's just going to do it because that six-ton Halibi elephant can't really be changed by that tiny rider. And often, and that's why I found it fascinating, is I was like, well, yes, that's exactly how I feel sometimes. Now, I know a certain decision should be made that way or, you know, I know I should go more to the gym. I know I shouldn't watch Netflix. I know I should treat everyone the same, no matter the background. But that elephant is driven by herd mentality. That elephant is driven by a preference for similar others. That elephant is driven by the default and status quo bias to leave everything as it is. And that just kind of opened my eyes because I was like, okay, I know all those things. I know what can make me maybe more productive, what can help me focus, what can help me become a better version of myself. But now knowing that there is this elephant, that system one, which makes, by the way, over 99% of our decisions every day, that's what really is driving me in there. And I think from then I started to think about, okay, all those decisions we make, how can we design an environment that almost gives that elephant a pass to walk now, you can, again, that tiny rider can't stop the elephant if it wants to go one way or, you know, get the elephant going if it doesn't want to go. But you can design an environment, almost like a path for that elephant to know, okay, I should maybe go a little bit more that way, a little bit more that way. Give the elephant a purpose. Why is it important? To do this? Why is it important, um, you know, to build a consistent workout routine? Why is it important? to design that environment that decreases your temptation. Um, and I think that's how I think about decisions, those subconscious decisions made by the elephant and then those 
one percent of the decisions made by its rider, um, and and really they can overlap professional decisions, private decisions. We make plenty of subconscious decisions in our professional life, um, and the same is true for the private life, and and vice versa for rational conscious decisions as well. Yeah. Wow. That's actually a really great way of thinking about things. I think decision-making can be really complex and sometimes it's really hard to figure out how we make our own decisions. So having the elephant and the rider is like a really great sort of way of thinking about that. And you did mention, you know, like sometimes you're sitting down just watching Netflix and you know, you shouldn't be doing that. And I really want to talk about like feeling guilty about some decisions we make. Like, why do you think we still make those decisions that we know are probably bad for us and we shouldn't really be doing? that like sitting up hours on end watching netflix but like why do we still make those decisions yeah um great great question and again like very i could probably talk for ages about that but it really comes down to our brains rewarding themselves so if you think about sort of what what does it do when you check your Instagram, mess- uh, like your Instagram or your social media or your messages, well, it gives an instant reward to our brain, right? It's that moment of gratification. It's, yeah, just getting an instant reward, which then on the other hand, by the way, um, is almost like a firework of dopamine in our brains. Um, and that's probably something that's very tempting. If you work on your boring assignment or needing, needing to get that project done, there can be that moment of reward as well. But that reward is a bit further in the future. Right? After you finish that project, your boss comes to you, you've done great work, you have that feeling of achievement. Again, back to what I think productivity is to me. After a long day, you have finished your to-do list. It's actually a great feeling, right? Even though it was an effortful task, getting all that stuff done, but it's a good feeling. But the problem really is that that reward, that good feeling is a little bit further in the future, while you know, watching Netflix, scrolling through social media, um, checking your messages is an instant reward. And sometimes that temptation of the instant reward is just too high. And again, it's fascinating because how often do I say, okay, I'm just not going to take my phone into the bedroom because I know I'm just going to be there scrolling through YouTube and, ah, this video is interesting, I just want more. But then I still find myself doing exactly that. And it's just, it seems like that temptation of instant gratification, that instant dopamine to our brains is just just so high and it really almost, yeah, needs practice and sort of those habits to um, overcome it. But I think those tiny habits really can get you. But yeah, that's why I think even though you feel that guilt, that instant temptation, that instant gratification just overweighs it, um, overweighs it. And that's where we end up yeah, struggling to follow oh, through yeah. with our plans. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Sometimes I'll tell myself, I have to work on a uni assignment. Let me put my phone in another room. Let me delete a social media app so I don't go on it. But then I find myself re-downloading the app, going to the other room and grabbing my phone. And it's so hard because those like instant like moments of gratification are really great. And those make you feel really good in the moment while you're waiting for that more like future reward of like finishing the actual task. Do you think like we need to be better as individuals with like, you know, not feeling bad for giving ourselves those instant moments of gratification and reward? Yeah. Um, I don't think we should, you know, it's not about feeling bad. And at least for me, to be honest, like I, you know, I can feel bad off time about scrolling on social media, but does it change anything? Not really. Like our brains are just wired in that way, that that instant gratification, over biasing, or even that guilt. So it's really not about feeling bad about it. I think what can help many people is just starting to think about, okay, what are those tiny habits that bring me closer to my goal. And maybe knowing you're going to feel bad about it in the end, you know, helps you. So in the example of social media, you know, maybe it is starting with that habit to at night charge your phone downstairs in the kitchen and not even take your phone up to the bedroom. So just placing your charger downstairs. 
you know, maybe that's a habit. You know, maybe in the first couple of weeks, you still end up taking your phone into the kitchen, uh, into the bedroom a couple of times. But by building that habit, that good habit, you might, um, yeah, you might be able to sort of decrease the instant gratification. The same for working out. Like how, how often have I planned? So there's two two maxes, right? There's night max and there's morning max. So how, how often did night max say, all right, tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. I'm going to go for a run, a workout, and then, you know, be productive. And then morning max wakes up and suddenly those plans just seem so far away. So maybe the, maybe the good habit there is uh, preparing all your running clothes the night before next to your bed, all prepared. So all you have to do in the morning, jump into your clothes, go, no decisions to be made. You don't even have time to think about, ah, oh, should I do it? Should I not? What's the weather? Um, and where are even my workout clothes? Probably can't find them anyways. You know, maybe that's a good habit. I actually even heard of some people, um, they told me that they would just sleep in their workout clothes. <laughs> so they just wake up. And, and go straight to the gym or, or for a run. So, yeah, it's not really about feeling bad or not. It's really starting to think about what are those tiny hacks that very slowly, and it's really like step by step, right? That's another, it's called optimism bias uh, and planning fallacy in behavioral economics. We, um, like, we are too over-optimistic. We'd say... And, and also the planning fallacy. So our, our plan, so for instance, the Sydney Opera House, I don't know if you knew, but they planned to build that in four years, I think. In the end, it um, took like 15 years and cost 10 times the amount. And the same with habits, right? Don't overwhelm yourself. Like, I want to be, I want to build that consistent workout routine from today to tomorrow. And you know, that's how it's going to be. And then being disappointed and feeling bad if you can't follow through, just, that reason of explaining them is going to be those tiny atomic habits. Oh, I don't know if you've read the book, but James Gear, but it's very talks about it. So those are tiny atomic habits that get you to be a better version of yourself. Um, so don't, yeah, you know, don't tell yourself it needs to be perfect from today to tomorrow. It is a process and a slow process, but it eventually will get you there. Yeah, and I think. It's about discipline, I guess, being able to discipline yourself with some things. I am guilty of being that person who sometimes wears their like workout clothes to bed because I know I just sometimes will wake up and I will just totally throw all my plans out the window. Um, but it's really interesting to see what like individuals do to sort of maximize their productivity and really um, keep themselves accountable for doing the things they'll, they say yeah. they want to do. Yeah. And, 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 and about discipline, I mean, I would agree to you to some degree it's your discipline and it's your willpower. But I think it's it's dangerous to to say you have to have that discipline or willpower. Like often I see people and I think that gets back to that example of how much of being productive is determined by your genes and by your talent and by your discipline and willpower versus how much is actually having those tiny hacks that make you more productive. Because Often people would probably think, oh, those successful people, they just have this, they just have the willpower to, to follow through with their plans. But I think everyone can have, you don't have to have that crazy amount of willpower. I think those successful people are just very good in decreasing the temptation, in creating that environment that doesn't even allow them to watch Netflix, you know, lie on the bed instead of um, getting work done and not going to the gym because of this and that. I think those people have a lot of tiny hacks. They might sleep in their workout clothes. They might have, you know, go straight from, from the gym to the office. In the office, they know they maybe work a little bit more efficient than at home because they're all those temptations. So I don't think it's only about discipline and willpower. I think everyone can become... Uh, more productive and a better version of themselves with those tiny habits. And and discipline and willpower comes with it. Um, and, and so don't don't tell yourself, I will never get there because I just don't have the discipline. I just don't have the willpower. No, like you get there with slow steps one by one. And that's, I think, how really successful people do it. Because in the end of the day, we're all humans. 
we are all driven by temptation, instant gratification, and we are all having those biases and heuristics. They're just part of our everyday decision making. Some people are just a bit better in overcoming those than others. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned before that we're irrational humans. So it's important to remember that. So I think that's something that will definitely stick with me. Um, Now, I want to dive a bit more into like the challenges of decision making. I know we've like touched on it, um, but let's talk a bit more about like decision avoidance. So what like holds people back from making better decisions and being more productive? Yep. So I think it's, um, sort of four biases slash heuristics that I think are in the way of people um, you know, being not productive or not being the best version of themselves. So the first one, and I mentioned it earlier before, is optimism bias. So we sort of say, well, you know, last time, yesterday, I wanted to work on my research. I set aside two hours uh, to work on my thesis and in the end, I, all I actually did is answer emails. But tomorrow or next time, it will be better for sure. That was just a one-off. And that's sort of what the optimism bias is, right? Not really learning from past experiences and being over-optimistic or overconfident about the future. Yeah, next time, for sure. Tomorrow, I have another two hours. This is when I'm going to work on my thesis. And then tomorrow arrives and it's the same, same problem. So I think it's that's the optimism bias that avoids people from yeah, being the most productive they sort of can be. Another one is planning fallacy. I also mentioned it before. And that's sort of not planning for all those external things that can happen. So say you have tomorrow a whole day of being able to be productive, working on your project or whatever it is. Well, have you planned for things like an emergency call, you know, one of whatever, one of your child at, at, at school gets, gets sick? Uh, have you planned for sufficient breaks, you know, getting a glass of water, having some food in between, um, maybe having a bit of downtime in between? Have you planned for those um, or not? Um, you know, sometimes you just need to get up and walk around or just go for a swim down the beach. So it's really okay. An eight-hour day, don't think it's eight hours of being productive. It's maybe three hours, if even, of being productive. And then there's all those things that can happen. Just how well are you in planning for them? So that's another thing I think that avoids people from being the best version of self. Another one is called bike shedding. I don't know if you heard heard of that one. Um, it Hi. actually got um, it got its name from a group of researchers observing a team that was working on building a new nuclear plant. And what they found is that a, a crazy amount of time that team before they actually started with the actual sort of work, the team spent on planning the bike sheds. So where do people you know, can people bring their bike sheds when they go to the um, when they go to work? And it's sort of the same as, yeah, you know, before I can possibly start writing my thesis, I need to go through my eighty thousand emails and need to be sure they're all um, answered. So that little sort of red button and the email program finally disappears, and I can focus on that. Or before I build my website and actually, you know, make decisions that help me building that website, I need to go through the 50,000 templates just to be sure that I picked the best one. That's sort of what bike shedding is. Before you start the actual work, before you actually start being productive, do everything sort of that is actually not important for it, but just, you know, you just think you need to get it done before you actually start. So I think that's also one that's really holding people back, including myself all the time. Um, by the time I actually start working, yeah, I already spend an hour just, you know, emails and answering Slack messages and stuff, even though there's nothing urgent. I just feel like, ah, I need to get that out of the way before I start. And the last one, and that really is, I would say, the core of at all of it, and actually even of many um, 
kind of sort of problems in society is uh, present bias. Uh, I actually like to call it the I'll start Monday effect. <laughs> so how often do we, and that's basically also the most common symptom of, of present bias is by the way, procrastination. Um, well, I, you know, today it feels too effortful, but I started on Monday. I'll start it tomorrow. I'll do it tonight. And then tonight or tomorrow or Monday I rise and it's the same thing again. We're all present bias, which means in the present, we want to do what's enjoyable. In the future, we, we postpone, we procrastinate everything that's effortful um, to the future. And yeah, that's probably really the core of what's holding us back of being productive, just saying, okay, I can't do it now, but I do it tonight and tonight arrives and, and, and it's, it's the same thing. And yeah, I think those are sort of four biases and heuristics that are really holding us back. Now, by the way, being aware of them is an important first step, but it's not going to solve the issue entirely, right? Our brain, unfortunately, doesn't work in the way as, oh yeah, hurrah, Max, Max told me you know, I shouldn't do bike shedding and I'm present by it and that's why I'm procrastinating. So now I know how to not be it anymore. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, but it is an important first step to coming up with ideas. Okay, how can I design an environment um, that prevents me from doing that bike shedding stuff? Um, you know, maybe before I actually start working, I don't even open my email program. I don't even, maybe I don't even connect to the internet if I don't need it for writing on my thesis. So I don't reply to all those emails. Um, you know, maybe with the templates for the website, it is just, you know, letting someone else make the decision for you and, and not scrolling through those 80,000 templates. So yeah, I think, so a bit of a long answer, but yeah, those four biases, I think that's really what's holding us back. Um, and, and if you can avoid some of those, we become a better decision maker. Yeah, definitely. And like, how can we avoid these? Like, how can we help mitigate some of the effects of our biases? And I really want to touch on present bias, especially because me personally, and I'm sure a lot of people um, watching this deal with procrastination every day. It's such a modern day issue. So what can we do to help avoid these biases? Yes. Um, being aware of it, as I said, great but not going to solve the issues. Now, there are a few sort of tiny tricks that I sometimes use and I know, you know many other people use. So obviously one is those tiny habits, right? We talked about them, just one of those tiny things, putting your workout clothes the night before, sleeping in them, um, those sort of things, very powerful and tiny, and it's a journey, a long journey. I think one thing you could immediately start with tomorrow is a thing called habit stacking. What that means is we all have habits that we do every day. Take uh, brushing your teeth, right? And we just do it. It's like, it's, it's our habit. It's part of our routine. Now, can you stack that habit with something that is effortful to you that you actually need to get done? Is it that while, you know, after you brush your teeth, you do 10 push-ups or even just two, two push-ups? Um, and then you increase that. You know, next time you brush your teeth, you do three, four, and kind of make your way after that. Or is it every night you go to bed? So when you make your bed in the morning, you put uh, a book onto your bed. So when you enter, so the habit of entering your bed at night, you stack it with reading one page, maybe even half a page of a book, slowly building and stacking that habit. Now, next time you enter your bed, again, in the habit of entering your bed at night, you read a page. The next time, a page and a half. So I think this is you know, one way that can help people to just connect something they do anyways with a habit they want to, want to evolve. And then the brain sort of learns it and knows if I do this, I do that. If I do that, I do this. And stack those habits. And it's sort of also similar to another hack which, uh, so Katie Milkman, also a great behavioral economist, um, can recommend sort of all her books. Um, she talked about temptation bundling. So what that is, is we all have something that's tempting us. Right? Again, for me, it's maybe social media or watching my favorite Netflix series. And again, it can be something different for everyone. 
And we all have stuff that is effortful. So can you bundle those two? Can you say, I only watch my favorite Netflix show when I'm on the treadmill in the gym? So, you know, those modern treadmills, they actually got the screen and you kind of start Netflix and stuff. So is that maybe your temptation bundling that you say, I don't watch my show unless I am on the treadmill or I only listen to my favorite podcast while I'm working out. So how can you bundle? Or maybe, you know, some people just love coffee and they know they drink too much coffee. Well, how about you only drink your coffee or your um, you know, cappuccino or whatever it is while you are working on your assignment, which you want to get done. So you bundle something that is effortful that you don't want to do. It's something that you really like. To do. Um, that's, that's one trip. It, it sort of certainly worked, worked for me in, um, with some, some things. So hopefully it works with others too. And then I think the last one that jumps to my mind is commitment devices. That's probably the sort of hardest way of following through with your plans. But I think sometimes you need to sort of have that way to tie your hands and just, you know, there's no other option. And examples for that is, you know, maybe your commitment device is, I don't know, you want to stop smoking. But your commitment device is actually talking with a family member and saying, hey, I want to commit stopping smoking. You need to be sort of my um, server nominator. Maybe it's your partner, someone that could easily tell whether you stopped or not. And, you know, I put $1,000 here. And if you see me that I don't commit to my goal, you're going to donate that. And most importantly, you're going to donate it to an organization that I hate. Because otherwise you have that excuse. Oh, well, I must stop smoking, but I donate for good cause, something I love. So that's sort of a commitment device. Maybe another commitment device is uh, not even buying any chocolate or any sweets. So you don't even have them at home. So there's no way you can, if you know, don't want to eat chocolate, have it at home. Another one is maybe, um, I don't know if you saw it, I found it cool. Optos, I think, they, they put on that new food feature, which is called Optos Pause. So with the click of a button, you can actually sort of shut down the Wi-Fi for the whole family. Um, oh. You know, maybe that's your commitment device. So you can't even go into social media because Wi-Fi is up. Um, and yeah, so commitment devices, I think are another way, again, a very sort of harsh way to follow through with your goals. But um yeah, I think those four sort of tiny habits, habit stacking, temptation bundling, and commitment devices, I think those are ways you can mitigate those um, biases and heuristics. Yeah, for sure. I think we've got some amazing strategies that now we can use, and I know there are some that I'll definitely apply. Um, I think we've established that decision-making is not a linear and straightforward process. So how do you view like trial and error in decision-making in the decision-making process? Like, for example, with the strategies you've just suggested, do you think like trial and error would be the best way to go about finding what works for you? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think with everything in life, you just have to give it a try. Don't overthink what, you know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Well, maybe habit stacking is not for you. Or maybe uh, preparing your workout clothes the night before doesn't do the job um, because for you, it's, you know, something different. I think just find out what works for you. Maybe take some of those tricks as a starting point. But, um, yeah, you kind of have to, again, we're all different, right? We're all heterogeneous. For some, it's Netflix. For some, it's social media that holds them back. Um, so just find out what, I think a good starting point is find out at the end of the day, what was holding you back from being productive. Maybe start there and then start with ways of, okay, how could you mitigate that? How how could you uh, avoid that distraction? Um, I think that's how I would probably um, go for it. And and also, interesting fact, like often people think about 
well, it's all those distractions. You know, it's the neighboring is being loud, and they start a construction site next door, and that's why I can't focus. I mean, it's true to some degree, but I think what's what's really holding us back is our own mind. And it's those biases, that planning fallacy, that optimism bias. So focus on that. There is external stuff you can't really influence. Just go with it. Just go with the flow. You know, it is how it is. Um, but, you know, what's what's like those things in your own mind that are really holding, holding your back? And those are the things you can um, improve. I actually just watched that Netflix documentary the other day. It was cool because sometimes in the 1900s, a guy came up, I think it was called like the productivity bell or like focus bell. It was basically like the massive helmet, which had just had two holes in where the eyes are. And at that time, it was meant to, um, I think, cancel the noise of 99% of everything else that's going on. Now, that obviously in our days, that's the noise canceling earbuds you have or, or the noise canceling earphones. But even though we have those things that decrease all the external stuff, did we really become more productive? I don't actually think so. And that's because we're all humans and it's all those things in our own minds that have always hold us back and will always hold us back. It's just trial and error. What are those tiny habits that work for you to decrease, um, decrease it a bit? And I actually would argue over probably you know, compared to a hundred years ago, it might even be, yeah, a little bit more difficult. Well, actually, I wouldn't say a little bit more difficult. I'd say, I don't know, what, what do you think? You know, a hundred years ago, there was no, so everything we talked about today, the distractions didn't exist a hundred years ago, right? A hundred years ago, well, there was no TV or no Netflix that could distract you not being productive. There was no social media, no phone. Um, there was books. Well, maybe that distracts you. But yeah, I, I, I was just going to say, and I think nowadays it's more difficult, but I'm actually not sure. I know what you think. Um, it's sort of harder to be productive in our days than it was 100 years ago. Oh, 100%. Like, yeah. I was just thinking before that there are so many different things you can distract yourself with today because of, like, the digital age and how many resources we have. Like, we don't just have books now. We've got ebooks, We've got audio books. Like, we've got so many different ways to read compared to just a physical book. Um, and we've got social media. We've got our phones. We've got travel. We've got so many different things we can, like, fill our time with. So I think it's so much harder these days and it would have been back then. I mean, I don't know what it was like back then, but like, I'm assuming it's harder now. It's harder. Yeah, I actually would, would be interested. Like, do you think they were the same when sort of books were invented? They were like, oh, and this is, you know, this is sort of the social media of our days. You know, this is going to hold people back from being productive because now they read those books and, you know, don't actually get the work done. So I'm wondering if it's just, yeah, if there were always things like that on the way, you know, maybe it was books, maybe then it was when TV started, even though they didn't have yeah. social media and all that sort of, but maybe now we have it all. So back in the day, it was like books, okay, one distraction. Then it was books plus radio, okay, two. Then books plus radio plus TV. Now we have everything plus social media and yeah, could be actually be harder. But that being said, um, I think there always were distractions from hundreds of years ago until now it's just yeah how good are you in overcoming some of those yeah exactly I definitely don't think <laughs> nowadays I would be like oh wow I've really got to read that book let me put aside what I'm doing I think <laughs> now for me it's like oh I really want to check my messages or yeah. scroll through it's social it. media yeah I, I'd laugh yes that would be my distraction now uh you know <laughs> oh I shouldn't read that book distracting <laughs> me I like that would be the best bad habit I think I'd have Oh, yeah, 100%. I would love to be distracted by wanting to read a book. Like, I yeah. think things have definitely changed since back then. Um, now, let's move into, like, prerequisites for good decision making. I know we talked about before how some people might not might think they're not good enough to, you know, make good decisions because they're just not good at being productive. Um, but do you think there are any, like, prerequisites we need to have in order to be able to make better decisions? Yes. Um, I think there is, you know, maybe one is about be making better decisions. One is about 
being productive. Let me start with being productive. I think the prerequisite of being productive is allowing your mind to get into that time to float, into that kind of sort of divergent thinking. Then you get it back and and uh, and, and converge the thinking. It's creating that environment um, that yeah sort of allows you to um, be productive. And that also means being aware of those biases and heuristics we talked about today. Because with, with awareness comes purpose, right? Now you know, okay, why is it important that I try to mitigate some of those biases? And so uh, with awareness comes purpose, with purpose comes sort of better quality decision-making, and with that better decision-making comes growth, personal growth and productivity. So I think prerequisites are being aware of what's holding you back, designing an environment that helps you mitigate a little bit those those things that are holding you back. And that will allow you to make better decisions and be more productive. Again, in theory, that probably listeners would now say, oh, sounds great, but you know, how do you actually do it? Well, again, it is hard. In theory, it all sounds easy. I struggle a lot of all of the things we're talking about today. But really, what are those tiny things? Even if you're just one percent more productive well great you know and then you go from there this is tiny um tiny tiny things um and the second one i think prerequisite is yeah like in today's world so we all have a, a mental capacity right sort of a brain power almost like the battery of your phone right and that you know, every all of the decisions you make, all of the thinking you do, especially sort of your system two thinking, that, that thinking the small rider does, that conscious thinking is draining of your mental capacity. Uh, anxiety, for example, is actually one of those things that are draining heavily on your mental power. I know, you know, I sometimes have days I maybe feel a bit anxious about a presentation. I have the next day, there is sort of a time pressure. Well, that's when I'm the least productive, even though I, you know, it's on to tomorrow. Once I feel anxious, like it's over, you know, I can't focus at all. That's sort of draining. And all those things drain on our mental capacity. Now, I think before we had phones, before we had social media, we had like little gaps in the day. Maybe you're waiting for the bus. You're waiting for in a restaurant for your friend to arrive. But you just sit there and you just, have that intentional space for your mind just to do nothing. Just maybe observe people. Now, in our days, each of those seconds, each second is filled up with something. You don't wait at the bus anymore doing nothing. You don't sit in the restaurant anymore doing nothing because you're seeing people, you know, I, I look like, if I'm not doing anything, like look checking my phone, it kind of looks strange, right? We all, like, we're on our phones 24-7 each second. And I think all of those seconds accumulate and draw from our brain power, from our mental capacity. And that, um, just, you know, by nature, how our brain works, just, yeah, just decreases your, your brain power at the end of the day. So I think that's another prerequisite, making intentional space again for your brain just to not think about anything. Uh, how can you get back that time that you now fill this checking your emails, answering to emails, because you all have it at your fingertips. How can you get that back? I think that's not a prerequisite um, that I think at least might, would help me um, to you know, make better decisions and be more productive. Yeah, no, that's really great. Um, moving on into a bit more about like what you do, I guess, um, we're going to go into our practices, habits, debrief section. So just here, we can flesh out those tips that you were talking about before. And essentially, this is where we ask the experts um, what they do personally to help them. So for example, in this case, um, what you do to be more effective with your decision making. So is there like a practice you do to cultivate your decision making? Yeah, I think there's a, a few. Um, so talking about, so we talked about commitment devices and temptation, but I think in regards to commitment devices, so what I do, for example, when I go to the gym, I don't take my phone because I know if I take my phone, it's going to take take me two hours. 
And if not, it's probably going to take me half of the time just being distracted. So that's sort of one commitment device. Okay, I leave the house. I don't even take it. You know, we always have those fears. Okay, what if you know, we get an important work call? What if this and that happens? Well, honestly, you know, most of the time I think we exaggerate a bit and we can be an hour or two without our phones, without being connected. Um, that's what really helps me. Say when I go down to the beach, I actually don't even take my phone. I think sort of that moment, the ocean and that hour deserves my full attention and not sort of half the attention and half the attention goes into my phone. Actually, the more we talk today, I realize more and more how great is that tiny device that really holds me back because you are always yeah. talking about the phone. But <laughs> I actually realize it's probably a big one for me. And yeah, temptation bundling, I think there's sort of also a few things um, that, that I do, you know, I'm, I definitely have like kind of a sweet tooth and, you know, maybe I reward myself a little bit with, okay, you've done the chief step today. All right, let's bundle it with a nice lunch, maybe something that you shouldn't get every day. Bring that, you know, we talked about that reward that is often far in the future. I think I try to bring that reward a little bit more and sort of reward my brain and myself along the way. So, you don't look for those moments of instant gratification and you sort of get get a bit of reward early on. I think that's, that's a few things um, that I'm sort of doing. Another one I think would be uh, was great, you know, sort of when you come, I don't know if you use a Mac or an iPhone, but I think they have now great sort of focus uh, modes. Yeah. So I think that's something uh, on an everyday basis helps me be a bit more productive. Um, yeah, I think that's some sort of hands-on examples how, how I use it. Yeah, I actually think it's a bit funny. Like you said, it's these devices that are holding us back sometimes, but they're also the ones coming up with little strategies like focus mode or personal mode to try and help us be more productive. I think that's like a strange contrast. Yeah, and, and I think actually um, a big organizations have actually understood that. Otherwise... Like, why would Apple come up with this focus mode if there wouldn't be an issue they have realized that actually people have? And that's yeah. how they can, yeah, bring value for people and sort of improve their well-being by giving them uh, an option to tie their hands. There's even more, actually one that exists for a long time. There's a website, I don't know, it already existed 10 years ago, that literally helps you block the internet on your computer for Facebook instagram and so on so uh, it's funny you're right that those things are out there even though in apple's interest you know maybe i don't know better the more they use your phone but yeah it's just interesting same with optus pause as i mentioned it there is options now we have all those devices and actually our uh, companies come up with ways to to get us a little bit away from it um, and being disconnected uh, a little bit more in the world. We seem to be connected all the time, right? But yeah. it's like a bit of an artificial connection. Like you're not, you're losing that real life connection of chatting with someone in the bus station, of observing someone in the restaurant, because yeah, you just always be connected with someone sort of in a virtual world. Yeah. And there are so many little things. Like I remember I used to use this, um, I think it's like a little web browser thing, but you grow a little tree. So you have to like put this thing up on your screen and it like counts the minutes that you're being productive and you're essentially growing like a tree. And if you exit out of the browser, your tree dies. So it's like forcing you to do your task and grow this tree at the same time. And if you like get distracted by something else, your tree dies which i think is, it's a really cute little thing that um exists yeah, yeah. By, by the way i think actually social media to some degree can also also help us a little being a bit more productive or following through some goals so you know like you know some people um i don't know maybe even sometimes myself would you know if you go to the gym maybe you kind of it was big i think a few years ago like in in facebook for example take your location or enter the gym now so you mm. let your network, you let your friends know, hey, I'm actually going to the gym. So I think that's also a way social media has helped using a little bit of that herd mentality, that social pressure to give people almost that commitment device. But to some degree, it's, it's, um, it might also help a little bit um, yeah, to actually follow through with your plans. So yeah, oh, 
working hard and kind of putting it on your Instagram story. Now, again, how real is that really? But, you know, if it helps some people to actually do it, because then yeah. they think, oh, but then I can at least post it and everyone knows I'm working hard. But why not? You know, I think there's anything wrong about it. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's really great. Um, I sometimes do that with social media, but I've been trying to make myself be a bit more authentic and just doing some things for me instead of like posting it online, which has become pretty important, I think, and a lot of people are aware of that. Um, do you think there are any challenges to the practices you do, for example? Like, for example, not taking your phone to the gym. Oh, well, I mean, of course, there's a bit of the expectations, you know, and it depends obviously which day of the time kind of you call it to the gym and uh, whether that's also your work phone and kind of what job you're going to work at. But, you know, it also depends. Like, I don't have I don't have children or kids yet. Um, you know, I fully understand that as a mother or dad, you might want to be connected because it gives, you know, what if one of your child calls you? Or if you go to the gym during the day in your lunch break, well, you might feel a bit anxious about not being able to be contacted at all by by work so i think there's maybe some some sort of risk that if really something happens i'm not connected but to be honest to me i'm afraid of a bit what's the benefit what's what's the um drawback and i think it's, it's totally fine i think you know maybe other consequences with the other examples i said is with social judgment so let's say your commitment devices you want to stop smoking you tell all your family and friends and what if you actually don't make it well, then you have to live with the consequences of people maybe making, judging you. I think that's a bit of a challenge. Again, it's probably important because it helps you to actually come to your goal, having that fear of being judged if you don't make it. But at the same time, there is a risk and no one of us wants to be judged. No one of us, no human wants to disappoint someone else. So I think this is a bit of the challenges that you have to live with the consequences of, um, yeah, of I don't, uh, kind of don't following through with your plans. But again, you always have to live with the consequences. Even if you don't tell anyone, then it's you that feels guilty, um, and which you probably shouldn't. But yeah, I think those are some challenges. Yeah, definitely. And would you recommend this practice to everyone? I know we said that everyone has to find their own things that work for them, but do you think there's maybe like one thing that, you could suggest to people that they should try that, you know, maybe has like a better success rate at working? Yes, I, I think it's back to the tiny atomic habits. Try to find what's holding you back. Try to come up with one tiny habit that gets you closer to uh, your goal, even if it's just putting your phone away for 30 minutes at a time out of reach. Even that having to stand up, you know, can be enough. I think just try to find out okay, today, what was holding me back? And how can I, with a tiny habit, come closer to that goal? I think that's really something universal that yeah. everyone can find a tiny habit that makes makes you a better version of, of yourself. Yeah, that's really great. I think we've left it pretty open for people to be able to find what works for them, but also have sort of maybe some things they can look at. For example, the biases we talked about, like doing some self-evaluation, seeing what works for them, what doesn't. So that's really great. And thank you for answering those questions. Um, so now we're going to go into questions from the audience. So I've got one here that asks, what makes a decision, a good decision, quote unquote, like good? That's a great Great, but I think often it's those like straightforward questions that really, really get you and it needs yeah. to, to think. Um, what makes a decision a good decision? I think, you know, there's so, again, think about how many decisions have you made today from what to wear. Well, is there really a good or bad? It's just maybe a good decision is one that's not holding you back for too long and sort of having that decision avoidance or choice paralysis. You know, maybe the good decision here is just going with one thing, not losing time in the morning. Then, you know, it gets to your breakfast. You decide what to have for breakfast. But I'd say the good decision there is, again, very subjective. I'd say what makes you feel good for the rest of your day you know, another more objective answer would be what's the healthiest for you. So it really 
comes down probably to you a sort of collective set of yeah, mindsets, values, the purpose you have, um, what's, you know, what's your purpose in life and how do the decisions that you make reinforce that purpose and make you lift that purpose. I think good is very subjective because what's good to yeah. me might be bad to you. And on the end of the day, what's your purpose? Where do you want to be? And did that decision you made, um, you know, get you closer to that goal? And then there's very different decisions, maybe on an executive level in an organization, where it's about how do we get people, um, you know, how do we get a more diverse workforce and drive inclusion? Very different. Maybe that's more objective, what is good and what's the right thing to do. So, you know, given that we do, so I read the other day we make uh, around 33,000 decisions um, a day. And... You know, that's to the majority just those subconscious decisions you make. Now, they're very different decisions. It's very hard to tell what's good, what's bad. But I think in general, what gets you closer to your purpose, to your goal, to your vision and mission, mission that is what, what's a good, good decision. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, it all comes down to subjectivity, which is um, what we talked about in the start as well. So it's really great seeing how that connects through now. Um, I noticed you mentioned choice paralysis. Um, would you be able to talk a bit more about that? I think that's quite interesting. Sure. So choice paralysis means you feel overwhelmed by the amount of choices, which results in you not being able to make a choice at all. So, for example, I actually wanted to uh, apply for a credit card the other day. Now, I'm not going to say which bank, but they, all, they actually all have like a lot of choices to make when it comes to the credit card. But there were at least, I think, 10 or 12 credit cards that I could have chosen from. There was low fee cards, low interest cards, rewards point, yes or no. I was kind of overwhelmed. And as a result, I said, okay, let's just wait. You know, I, I don't want, I won't make that decision today because I have no idea you know, what I need, what I want. So that's one example. Um, I think in the world we live in, especially if we live in the city, I actually suffer from choice paralysis all the time. Uh, what are we going to have for dinner? Uh, well, there's just so many choices to choose from. You know, it's hard to make that decision. Which movie are we going to watch on Netflix? That is sometimes what you know, takes me like 45 minutes just to yeah. choose that movie. That's why, yeah. by the way, uh, and that's what some of the research I'm actually doing is understanding how much people are willing to delegate decisions to AI, for example, and to third party providers to avoid that choice paralysis and, and, and to make it easier for them. And that's why I think Netflix, you know, it's great. They, they propose, hey, why don't you watch this? movie it seems like you know it's kind of aligns with what you've watched in the past great oh yeah helps me avoid that choice paralysis that sort of decision being overdone by the amount, amount of decisions but yeah that's really what um choice paralysis is feeling overwhelmed by the amount of choices you can make it happens all the time what i'm gonna wear if i standing in front of that big wardrobe um so yeah, i actually think the less choice that's that's what i love uh, friends are about the van life, you know, we are in very remote areas. Well, I can't choose whether I want Japanese, Korean barbecue, um, or like, you know, a Vietnamese roll today because that's just one pub or you cook yourself. And I love that. It's yeah. just easy. Like it's actually so, it's just a great thing. It really frees your mind, not having all those decisions to um, make. And it's something from an evolutionary perspective that our brains are just not wired in the way that would help us making those decisions. If you think back in the day when you know, we were sort of hunter, hunters and gatherers, well, the, you know, the decision was pretty easy. You know, what are you going to do to survive today? And that's, that's it. You know? um, and, and now I think it's become a lot more complex and uh, yeah, choice paralysis is definitely a thing for me, and I think for many people. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I That's why I asked you about it because I was like, I definitely do this a lot. Um, you're overwhelmed with so many possible parts or decisions you can make where you just get stuck sometimes. Um, so I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that. And our second question from the audience is, how can we overcome self-doubt when making decisions? Um, even this could relate to choice paralysis, I think, as well. Yes, I think it really, really relates. Um, so it's sort of in a gang. The more we talk today, the more I actually realize how oh, I suffer from all of those things um, <laughs> my, myself. I, you know, not that it's that bad, but uh, yeah, just having, not being sure about whether the decision you just made was a good one or not. And I think it's really about not, you know, we can't change it anyway. Don't look bad. When we made that decision, that's actually a thing why, you know, in an organization, sort of an executive level, um, what, what your main skill is, is that decision making fast sometimes intuitive decision making and not all decisions are going to be right, but just living with it. And, you know, you sort of have to, the majority of your decisions are actually good decisions. And I think, you know, I'd actually just say, don't look back. Um, you know, it hasn't been a bad decision. It maybe has been a decision that you learn from and you make it better, um, better next time. Yeah, for sure. I think that's really great to remember. Um, and just not being too hard on ourselves is especially important. And I've got one more question from our audience. Um, so how much of others' input should we consider before making decisions? And I also um, noted this before just for myself, um, that there are a lot of stakeholders that can be involved when we're making decisions. We're not always just thinking about ourselves. There's always someone else we're maybe trying to please or someone else we have to consider in the process. Um, so, yeah, what do you think about that? Yes. So I think, again, great question from the audience. And I think, especially in a professional sort of context, you're right, like there's different people that give an input for a decision. And I think what's very important is that all of those ideas, all of those inputs are actually being heard and everyone is given a voice. What I observe quite a lot is CEO comes into the room, say, hey, today you have to make a decision about X and Y, and I think we should do this. Well, you can kind of imagine how the conversation follows after that, right? The room is primed and those inputs of different people might already be very biased towards what the CEO or maybe what the person with the authority in the room or just the loudest people in the room think. Um, there are actually really great sort of um, uh, programs and, and sort of technology out there. So one is called Agenua, which is a decision flow management program, which reduces group think, which makes sure all those inputs that should make a decision in a professional sort of context are heard. And importantly, also gives you know, the managed, managing director, CEO, whoever it is, that accountability and visibility of okay, how did we come up with that decision? Because often it's also hard to tell if several stakeholders are involved, but how did we actually end up with that position? You know, it's kind of a bit of an ambiguous process. Oh, well, you know, Max suggested this and then we kind of tweak that way. Like no one really knows how did we end up with that position? So yeah. I think that visibility, our accountability, and there's some great tools out there. You know, can, you can even just maybe in the room, instead of asking, okay, we have a decision to make, I think that's it. What do you guys think? Well, take, take some post-its and say, okay, I think we should make a decision today about where the best coffee comes from because we have a new coffee machine. What do you guys think? You have two minutes, write down what your preference is, and then we share and make the decision. So that's also a way how you reduce that group thing. And you can do that online as well. You know, Myro, Merrill, send out an email, ask for opinions first and sort of decision inputs and then make the decision. Um, I think, yeah, there's great ways to reduce that group set and make decisions better and everyone's voice heard. I think that's very important because it shouldn't matter whether you're more extrovert, whether you're more introvert, whether you're more optimistic, pessimistic, your idea counts and yeah. any input, you know, sort of shapes the decision in, in a way. There's no bad idea. There's no good ideas. There's only ideas. And in the end, you should just, if it's not your idea or your input that comes to the decision, well, it doesn't matter. Just thank the person which input came to it because that's how we can all keep our jobs and, and grow the company. 
Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's what I think. You have to make sure all voices are heard and reduce that group sync. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. No, I love that. Um, I think we can move into our open mic section now. So if, during this part, we normally just get our guests to talk about anything that they're passionate about. It doesn't have to be related to what we've been talking about today. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Max, now. Um, what would you like to talk about? Uh, many options. Um, I mean, what, we could talk about man life. We could talk about my passion for the ocean, uh, the research I'm doing. What's your preference? I'll leave it to you. Um, we did mention this before and I instantly just jumped at van life. I've been so curious about that. So I would love to hear you talk about that. Sure. Um, all right. So basically it all started, um, I think two years ago. So my partner and I, we had this dream for a long time, um, travel Australia in a van, you know, just that's just it. We are both not Australian. We have love for this country, the nature, the oceans, um, you know, the people like uh, we just saw the best way to travel Australia is in a van. So I think it was, um, yeah, so one night I scrolled again, you know, bad habit on my phone at night, <laughs> but at least it was a good outcome. Um, scrolled through sort of, you know, vans that were to sell and yeah, just found one van, woke up Mariana, was like, I think this is the van. And I think like a week later, we, we went there, I bought the van. And yeah, from then, we basically try, so we're you know, based in Sydney, but we basically try to at least three months a year travel to a different part of Australia in the van. And um, I sort of am lucky enough that the, the organization, um, so it's via Unity, an agency uh, I work for, it's really about the outcome, not the hours. And they're very open to it and allowed me to you know, keep working during that time. Um, so I work sort of remotely uh, a little bit from from the van. And yeah, so two years ago, we went to South Australia, which I think is one of the best places in Australia for van life in summer. Um, you guys are closer visited than me. It's just, you know, warm during the day, it cools down a bit during the night, the landscapes, the nature, and the ocean is just breathtaking. I think South Australian people are just lovely super helpful Australians in general but yeah South Australia kind of I think topped it so that's when we went two years ago over summer now last year we went to um we drove from Sydney to Esperance oh, which okay. is in the southwest so it's in WA and it's sort of after you cross the Nullarbor which is that seemingly like endless stretch of desert it is actually the longest straight road in the world, I even think. I'm not sure if Australia or the world. So it's 160 kilometers, 99 miles. Wow. Oh. Just straight. Like you don't even have to move the steering wheel. <laughs> it's crazy. And um, it's beautiful though. So after you sort of come from the east, cross the Nullarbor, just sort of 1,500 kilometers of nothing, you come to Esperance, which is that untouched, pristine place where you just can't believe your eyes, crystal clear water, you think you're just on an island somewhere like in Greece. Um, wow. And it's just beautiful. Uh, you could drive on all the beaches. So we literally slept in the van, like on the sand on the beach, um, you know, cook up dinner and just sleep. And yeah, I think over now, there was our second trip and we just met such interesting people uh, from all walks of life. Um, even though you're in such remote areas, you connect with so many more people than you know here in the city i i live like you know above and below me living people i don't often even know what they're doing or who they are and there yes. you're in such remote places and regional areas and you meet interesting people um yeah so that's been sort of our van life journey um over yeah the past couple of years and still australia is massive so there's still a lot of places we need to go including um we did the Great Ocean Road, so close to yeah. Melbourne, which was great too. But yeah, Tassie, we went to Tassie, want to go to the Northern Territories, want to go sort of to the northern part of WA, Ningal Reef, um, maybe wow. just winter, um, Queensland. Yeah, I think, yeah, you'd need like a few years just full-time traveling in the van to see all. 
Wow, no, that's that's so incredible. Um, South Australia is so underrated. I recently went yeah, there man. too. Um, do you have like a favorite spot that you went to? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Like, I really lost the Air Peninsula. So sort of, there's the the three peninsulas, right? There's the Florio Peninsula, which gets you over to Kangaroo Island. There is the York's Peninsula, which is sort of that long stretch. And then there's the Air Peninsula, which gets you closer to sort of the desert, which stops you, right? I think yeah. the Air Peninsula was just topped it all. There's a place called uh, Streaky Bay. Oh, okay, it yeah. It's around eight hours from Adelaide. Um, small community, but just great, like amazing beaches, world-class surf, lovely people. Um, also world-class fishing, by the way. So you can't, <laughs> if anyone's into, into fishing. Um, so I really loved that. We loved Kangaroo Island. Um, which if you hopped over there, that was amazing too. But yeah, it's just all amazing. But I think Kangaroo Island and the Air Peninsula, Sticky Bay, uh, my, my, my favorites. Where have you been? Um, so I went from Melbourne up, so I didn't get to the other side where um, the other peninsula was, but um, I loved Mount Gambia so much. It was so beautiful. Have you been there? I haven't been there, but I, I've seen they have all those sort of uh, – Sinking holes as well, right? Yeah, Did you yeah, go to we, any of those? Yeah? yeah, we went to like the big one, um, Umphison. I'm not sure if yeah. I'm even saying this right, but it was so beautiful. And then there was yeah. this place called the Little Blue Lake, and it was oh, it's such a stunning place. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that side we still need to um, need to explore. I really want to go to those sinking holes, see the video. So the free diving is one of my hobbies. So that sort of, I think the visibility there is like 30 meters, just crisp clear. And yeah, goes so deep, and that just looks so cool. Um, so yeah, definitely want want to go there. And I, I think that part between Adelaide and Melbourne, um, really beautiful too. It's really nice, yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned free diving. Um, we went to this place called the Kilby Sinkhole. Um, didn't go free diving because my skill set's not that advanced. But um, we did like snorkeling in there, and the water is so crystal clear. It's beautiful. Is it cold though? Um, yeah, they said it consistent temperature of i think like 11 degrees or eight degrees or something oh, yeah. it was freezing though yeah it was very yeah. cold oh yeah. yeah that's i feel like we need another whole podcast just to talk about all amazing spots and, i um, know i would so do that yeah but um yeah so any yeah anyone listening here get out and explore <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. Um, so thank you so much for answering all those questions. And that brings us to the end of today's podcast. So thank you so much, Max, for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I think we've learned so much. And we've also got some travel tips now too, which is great. I don't know about you, but you sound very productive when it comes to travel. Um, so yeah, thank you so much um, for that. And for those of you who want to, for those of us who want to find out more about you and what you do, um, where can they go? Yeah, sure. So feel free to connect on on LinkedIn, uh, Max Reisner. Um, always you know, happy to, to chat, uh, whether that's about behavioral science, decision making, or if you just want to go for a surf or dive, uh, clean too. Um, yeah, I think LinkedIn LinkedIn is um, it's a great way yeah, to connect. And yeah, thanks, Joanna, for having me. Absolute pleasure. And I take it as an absolute compliment being productive in travel. I think I've never heard that. That's great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if it's, yeah, I think we should be more productive in the things we love. Yeah, for sure. So um, we have Max's details in the description below. Thank you again for being here. And to our listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe on whatever platform you're using. And we'll see you next time. You have been listening to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this show, please consider rating our show, sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, pp.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Joanna. Thanks for tuning in.